All right, guys, you have now set up your database. Most of your players and your opponents and your teams are logged in. And now we're getting down to the serious business, how to actually score games and log the data into match day. All right, so it all starts, we go into the top right corner there to our menu where we can find the download scorecard. These you can download onto your own computer and then print as many copies as you like. At the moment, we've listed it on an A4 page with two cards, one on the left and one on the right. The reason we do so is say your scorer looks at the number 15 on the field and that number 15 gets replaced then he simply goes on to the next page. So we know we always score a 15 or whoever started playing as a reserve onto that position. So now guys, if your, say your number 15 um, gets replaced and there's a new 15 on the field and suddenly during the game, you decide to move him to number 11. This can just be listed on here. Now, uh, the rule of thumb is the position you played the longest on the day is the one you're going to be logged for. All right, so it's very rare that a player will play 10 minutes here and 10 minutes there. Usually he might play 20 minutes as a reserve 15 and then you move him to 12 or, or 5 minutes. So, you know, this is not going to be the most accurate data, but it is, um, it's a solution nonetheless. Just make sure that you list him in the position where he played the longest. All right, so now we have our card, and as you can see there, minutes played. The person in charge, most of the time, it will be an assistant coach, it can be a parent, it can be a fellow player, um, is going to make sure that there's a cell phone or a watch there where you can start the game, and as soon as a player gets injured, you can now say, right, um, you go on onto the second part of your page, you're going to score the number 15, uh, the new 15 that comes onto the field there, and you're going to log the minutes for the first player there. All right, so as soon as you've logged those minutes, you just tell the scorer, all right, Jimmy has played 25 minutes and 30 seconds, please write that down. And then if there's a second um, uh, substitution, then obviously you know how many minutes are left for him to play. So there you kind of just have to, to bear in mind um, how long the rugby game is that you're scoring, and work out roughly the minutes played for each player. Um, in the schools where we worked, we even got the, the players themselves to kind of start taking along with this, either be it on their watches or on their phones. But you know, the, the more accurate you get this, the better your statistics will look, because it is quite important to know how busy guys are per minute, as opposed to just in a game, because uh, especially when you want to pick your reserves. Um, you want to know how effective they are in the few minutes of play that they get in comparison to the incumbent player. All right, so now we're just going to look at our attack. A ruck, while we have the ball, it's a very simple question. Is the player you measure involved in the ruck in any way, shape, or form? In other words, is he bound into any other player who is close to the ball at that minute, or is he not? So a player who is standing away from an attacking ruck is not part of it. Anyone who is tied into it, close to it, lying on the floor, standing in the way, slowing down the ball, he is part of that attacking ruck. All right, similarly with a decoy run on attack, a player, so let's say a winger, who is standing away from the ball. The ball gets passed between 9 and 10. He's standing away, kind of waiting for the ball to come to him, is not part of that decoy run. But any player who's kind of running towards the ball or running as if to receive the ball but does not receive it is still running a decoy. So the ball could have gone to him, but it didn't. So obviously your 12s and your 13s will register a lot of decoy runs. From phase 3 or 4 or 5, you can see flankers and eighthmen and locks and hookers and all the guys standing in pots will all register a lot of decoy runs. Okay, so this is an important step mostly to see how involved your outside backs, who have no reason to be involved, are involved. Okay, so that's the deep way run. Pass and offload is fairly easy. You get rid of the ball before or after contact. That's the difference between the pass and the offload, so it's quite straightforward. Or do you kick it? So you've, you've neither passed it or offloaded or kicked it, and the only thing that remains is you are carrying the ball into contact. And here, you can find your own definition for this. Ours work like this. If you carry the ball into contact and you beat the advantage line, 
on the gain line, and you manage to get the ball back into play, that will be a winning carry. Because it's no point you're running, you're gaining the advantage line, you're getting over, but then you spill the ball, or they manage to turn over the ball on the ground. So it's quite important to lock. He's carrying the ball, he's going over the advantage line, I can get ready to, to, to give him a tick, but now he loses the ball on the ground, no tick, it's still a losing carry. All right. So a losing carry, very straightforward, is that one where you don't give the ball back for, for your own team, or you run into contact and you are tackled backwards. All right, so that is a losing ball carry. Now we go to defense, roughly the same thing. Are you part of the ruck or not? If not, you don't get a tick there. If you are, you'll get your tick. Tackle made, our definition was, you make contact with the ball carrier and you manage to bring him down to ground or repel him away from the advantage line. It's a tackle mate. Even if you didn't bring him to ground, you moved him away from the advantage line. That's a tackle mate. Now, a dominating tackle, again, here you can get your own definitions. Ours were you managed to bring the player to the ground or to prevent him from playing further. And all of this happens behind the game line. So you've totally dominated that tackle, you brought him away from the gain line, plus you've, you've made it impossible for him to offload or pass. All right. But again, this is up to you. You make your own definition of what a, dom a dominating tackle is, and you stick to it, and you train every scorer in your school to score that way so that your data has integrity and, and that it's all the same. Tackle assist, quite easy. You were not the first arriving tackler, but you help your mate. And then a missed tackle, you've made contact with the ball carrier, but he broke that contact. In other words, he managed to break loose from your grasp, and as such, you've missed the tackle. All right. Again, make your own definition and stick to it. All right, guys. So now you've signed your little form here, the scorer's name. He gets to sign. The only way we do this is just so that we can kind of make sure that the same players are not scoring, are not being scored by the same scorers. So especially later on in the year, these guys know, hey, you know, if I can get some good marks set up here, and if I know kind of who scores my games, or, or as soon as a guy comes to you and he says, sir, can I score the number 10, or why I always score the number 10, then that's a very good reason to not do it, all right? We need to keep the data uh, uh, nice and fresh and true and honest, and to do so, you have to rotate who watches who, but also remember if a uh, prop is watching the play of a 10 and scoring the play of a 10, he in effect is seeing the game from the from the vantage point of a number 10. So he learns, he learns a lot about angles, running lines, when to kick, where not to kick, right? So it is important to keep rotating the whole time. Okay, but now we got your forms, the match is finished, all our uh, reserves are put on, we scored our extra cards, everything's done. Now when we go back to match day, we simply go to cards, and over here on the right, the nice big blue button, we're going to log a new card, and we're going to pick his team, it was the under 15 A's, it was Ben Squire, he plays number 5, our opponents were Aubrey, and he played for 55 minutes. And now I can just log all his total scores. All right, so you can just use the little buttons there on the right to tally up or, or um, reduce the scores, or you can delete and simply type them in. Again, guys, please use your players to do this. The more involved they are in the process, the more they buy into the analysis and the statistics and what you're trying to do through this. So don't do this yourself. Yes, at the start, you can be there to kind of um, administer the whole setup. But after a while, please make sure that these guys punch the cards and then that they punch them correctly and that they take ownership of that. You're just going to press save as soon as you're finished. And now that is going to be logged into your database. All right. So that's basically it. Um, if there's any other questions, please contact me through your email. Um, but I'm sure this is fairly easy to understand. Just as a last thing, make sure your players are seated right next to each other. We used to do it 5-5-5 five, 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 so that the person administering the game knows exactly who is scoring which player at all times. So that's it from me, guys. Thank you very much.